still talking? Testing one, two, three. Yeah, no, it's good to me. It's just because yeah. that's picking up. Okay, good. And then let me just go right into confirm mode. Probably might be jumping to some dream mode or anything, but nope. I think this will be good for right now. Yep. And yeah, whenever you want to start, you can start. And you should be live. Okay, excellent. Thank right, you. No mm -hmm. problem. Here for the tutorial? Mm -hmm. Yep, nine people registered. We'll see how many show. <laughs> yep. Yep. I like to point with the uh, cursor occasionally. Can you see that on the screen? Okay. Yeah, okay. It's kind of small, but we can see it. Yeah. That works so that then people, if they're anyone's tuning in remotely, they can see it too. It's about time to start, so we'll get going here and let people, the, the beginning part is going to be introductory anyway before we get to the meat of the, um, the presentation. Um, <coughs> if you want to follow along, there's um, a URL on the whiteboard over there uh, that um, basically points to the tutorial materials. And, um, and on the left side of the uh, page, you'll see um, a selection for tutorial materials, and then you can go to the um, PowerPoint slides <coughs> for viewing this. <coughs> Otherwise, we'll just begin here. So we'll be talking about um, storage and workflows um, and how you can best do them here at MSI. The outline will be that we'll start with an, uh, a very high-level overview of both hardware and systems and software for uh, that are available worldwide and what the state of the art is. Um, then we'll progress <coughs> to more specifically what's available here across campus and the ecosystem we have here at the U of M um, for uh, data storage and moving data around. And then we'll um, focus in on the meat of the presentation um, on what's available here at MSI and how you can most effectively use it. Um, I'll give some, I'll talk specifically about the, um, the hardware you have here, the, the software that you, uh, is available for driving it, um, strategies for using it, um, as well as then some uh, use cases which illustrate how you can eff uh, do effective workflows given the resources we have here. And then if there's time and interest, there's a hands-on at the end. So an underlying principle of all of this is that there's a storage hierarchy. And that's going to be true in just about any environment that you'll ever be dealing with a lot of data. And it really comes down to a practical matter of how you organize computational work on hardware that's available today. And one way or another, the processing of the data has to go through a CPU. And usually that's sort of a, you can think of that as a bottleneck, which has the smallest memory capacity, but has the highest performance that you're going to see. And so as you move away from the CPU, the amount of storage that you have available becomes larger and larger. So the capacity grows. And so does the granularity of the data access, the, just the fundamental way that it accesses the data. Um, by contrast, um, as you get closer to the CPU, performance increases, but so does cost per byte. 
And all of this is quite relevant when you're thinking about workflows and managing very large volumes of data. And to a large extent, um, optimizing a workflow corresponds to organizing your work in such a way that you find the sweet spot in this um, hierarchy where you can stay and where and how you can stage your data. And I'll be illustrating examples of that. Traditionally, these, this middle, middle three in yellow here are um, what you can run a normal um, file system on, what you normally think of as a file system, a uh, POSIX compliant file system, that is to say, where all of your standard applications can be um, I.O., file system style I.O., in ways that you're familiar with from a desktop environment. And that includes memory. Um, and I'll illustrate how you can use the memories on any of our Linux systems to treat it as a file system and uh, get much better performance there. If you're interested in following along, for those who have come in a bit later, there is um, a URL up on the whiteboard which points to um, this tutorial page. And on the left side of that, you'll find the tutorial materials. Okay. So the hardware that we have available that really supports all of this is pretty much standard hard disks as, as we know them, both um, SATA and SAS style drives. They've been around for quite some time. Uh, they've increased in capacity and bandwidth a, a bit. But um, more or less, these numbers are ballpark still accurate. And um, a few salient features here is that they have finite capacity on the upwards of 8 gigabytes per, di per drive. Um, they have finite bandwidth, and that's going to be limiting the, the rate at which you can access the data. But also, and very importantly, they have a finite mean time to failure, um, which is in the millions of hours. But when you put a lot of these together, and to, for petabyte file systems, you're literally putting millions of these together, that mean time to failure, of course, spread across the whole system goes way down. And so you have to do things to accommodate that. And it changes the, um, the nature in which you have to manage and maintain that storage. And that isn't your problem as a user. It's our problem as a center. And the deal is, is that we cannot just buy storage and then have it sit there forever. It requires staff and hardware to maintain that system on an ongoing rate, replacing the failing drives as they crop up. And for that reason, at scale, and this is pretty much true across the board, when you get up to the petabyte scale of data, you really can't buy storage. Uh, one way or another, you have to rent it. And the same is true here as a matter of policy at MSI. Because we have a budget um, for users generally, just in the same way we can give out cycles for free, we can give out some amount of storage for free. But behind that, there's an ongoing cost that the university is paying for. If you need more storage, you can get it, but at that point, you then have to pay for it because we can't afford. We can't afford it, basically. A big part of what this tutorial is about is to inform you how you can leverage the resources that we do have freely available to you and, and perhaps improve your throughput and the capacity and the volume of data that you're dealing with in very meaningful ways. And I'll be showing you how to optimize that because we have a variety of storage platforms with various volumes of, of capacity that will allow you to do very large data sets and look at them and process them. Now, beyond the hard drives um, that spinning media, there's also SSDs. And these are much more expensive. They have a similar mean time to failure, but they, um, and their capacity is comparable. Uh, but what's really special about them is that the, it's very, very fast. And the latency is very, sm sl um, very low, so that it's almost like memory. Uh, and so in the sophisticated shared file systems that we stand up for you, these will be used, integrated into the system, 
and will usually um, support some kind of a tier of caching on that file system. Um, and it leads to an interesting property that you'll see time and again when you go and ma um, do I.O. on large volumes of data, that what you'll see is typically you can write data very, very fast. But when you go to fetch that data back, oftentimes it'll come back much more slowly. And the reason why is when you are writing the data, it's going straight to some kind of level of cache, which it can usually write to immediately. But after the data has been sitting there for a while, the caching system on a busy file system will naturally migrate that data to back-end RAID storage systems. And that is a higher latency, so it takes longer to get to and lower bandwidth. And um, it's also shared across many, many users. And as a result, what you'll oftentimes see is the writes will go much faster than the reads. And that's something to take into account, and it's just the practicalities of how these parallel file systems work. Then there's memory. And the system memory on our, um, on our Linux systems is available as a file system, and I'll, I'll show you how you to access that. And this is going to give you the best performance, lowest, la lowest latency and best bandwidth. And the, um, but you're sharing that memory with the applications that are running. So it's limited to the, the, the system memory that's available on the local host, but it's a very nice place to stage data, especially if you have highly fragmented I.O. And so I'll illustrate the, um, how you use that and the influence it can have in the performance of your workflow. And then speculation about the future, where things are going in terms of anything from genetics to improved disk drives. Um, this is speculative, and uh, one takeaway from the slide is that it is not available today. Not here at this center, at least. We don't have the budget to invest in these highly speculative um, uh, storage media, and it's not clear that um, it would be the best way to spend the limited dollars we do have. Um, that's just simply not our mandate for developing these new technologies. However, we are keeping our eye on technologies as they emerge and trying to provide the best value for the university's dollar. But there could be much better storage um, in the future, and we're always looking for it. Now, in terms of this low-level storage technologies, you can build various systems on top of it. So um, in terms of the um, low-level hardware, the disks and the SSDs, um, you can do RAID striping and make larger volumes of data with, with parity bits. You can um, then build file systems on top of that. And the primary file system we have here is what you have for your home directories. It's a Panassis file system, and or PanFS, and um, it's a shared file system that is really visible across all of uh, MSI systems, both Linux and Windows systems. Um, then on top of these file systems, you can build services, and can cloud-based services, databases, and such, and, you, and your own applications in particular. Okay. So this is just an overview of technology as it exists today. And then there's this factors of 10 that basically relate um, just as a general overview, um, things like capacity, um, number of files, um, and bandwidth to um, the various places you can stage data. And the real takeaway here is that these numbers really haven't changed by a large amount. Um, in the last few years, since it was posted at a, from San Diego Supercomputing Center back in 2015. So these technologies aren't changing very rapidly in terms of the capacities that are available. Um, they're tried and true technologies. Uh, they are cost-effective technologies. Uh, but what we have to work with this year is a given. And so the, the point of this tutorial will be how you can use that the most effectively and what options are available here at MSI. So um, one aspect in the shared file systems that we do have here 
and is, this is pretty common across um, at many centers, is that there is, um, because of that mean time to failure of a million hours or so um, per disk, and then you, you put together millions of disks to put together petabytes worth of storage, um, in order to deal with that, they have to put in some amount of redundancy to be able to handle um, disk failures so that you're not losing data. And so the most simple way to do it is simply with mirroring. So this will double the number of disks that you need for a given capacity of storage. Um, and it's one of the simplest and tried and true ways of doing it, um, but there are more efficient ways in terms of say, such things as RAID stripe, um, disk arrays, um, where you only use uh, one or a few um, disks as par for parity bits. So you have just a, a, enough redundant data so that if any one of the disks fails, you can recover from the redundant data that was available on the others. In both these cases, though, um, you have to have a staff that's actively on, on the ball finding disks and replacing them. One of the um, problems that people ran into that gave RAID striping a bad name early on was people didn't even realize when the disk would fail and nobody was monitoring it closely and so when the second or third disk failed, then they actually lost data. Um, in order to prevent that from happening, you have to have an ongoing staff that's maintaining it, as we do here at MSI. Now, an interesting um, thing that is really worth knowing about that um, is, uh, that's uh, available on some of the more um, functional file systems is snapshots. And we have that here for your home directories. Snapshots have saved my bacon multiple times. Basically, um, it's incremental archives of everything that you have under your um, user and home directories. And what it means is that if you accidentally delete a file, you can go back to a snapshot of last night or of the previous week and find a copy of that file and recover it. So if a file gets edited or garbled for any reason, you have a fallback for retrieving it. And I've used this multiple times in my own case. Let's see. And then, of course, there's tape backup. Uh, and we have that available here at MSI as well. And so all of these levels of redundancy are available to you for a variety of reasons. The nice thing about the tape backup especially is that it allows us for off-site storage so for disaster recovery. So we, we have that and, so, and fully support that. And we have a fairly good track record of not having lost any data that's um, under people's home directories. And that comes at a significant cost. That functionality is really worthwhile because it saves your work but then you have to understand the nature of what your home directory really is. It's not so much a place to store bulk data. What it really is is a place to store that critical amount of data where your time and your work went into because it is so lavishly backed up and so lavishly cared for at a great cost per byte, which we can afford but only up to a certain scale. Beyond that, there are other um, options that we have here at MSI that will allow you to scale much further in storage capacity, and I'll be covering that. Now, the ecosystem across campus, um, is, there's a variety of um, resources that are available, and they're, they very nicely complement each other. They really have different mandates, and they really don't compete. So for example, your um, departmental systems, that is really for access. So it will support your desktop, um, it'll support your, the desktop's um, access to the internet, um, and then your own documents, um, whether it's PowerPoint slides, um, or small files, or even your source code where you might be developing um, code just locally. Um, it's not necessarily going to be high performance, or large capacity, but it's very, a very, it serves a very valuable function for giving you access from your office. OIT um, provides its own kind of storage, their Isilon storage and their Google Drives, um, 
And um, we use that a lot here at MSI for a lot of our documents. In fact, this tutorial is being played off of Google Slides, OIT's Google Slides. So we really leverage off of this. But again, this is not um, a very different mandate from what MSI does, which is really high-performance computing. And high-performance computing used to be just pure number crunching and isolation. Nowadays, it's much, much broader in context, supporting really large uh, data-intensive type workflows, as well as heavy-duty number crunching and the synthesis of the two. Um, and so the storage uh, um, options we have here include our tier one storage, which is basically your home directories and your user directories. Tier, tier two storage, which I'll be getting into, um, which is an object-oriented store, which allows you much larger capacity for storing data. And I'll illustrate how to use that and how you can use it to actually improve throughput. And then there's also tape um, backup as well. We have our own archival backups for disaster recovery, but there's also uh, tape that um, you can purchase for storing larger volumes of data in the, type li in the tape library. Finally, there's um, the uh, library is supporting its own drum drive system, and they have their own um, data repositories, which are a very nice complement to everything else, because what they provide is not so much the high performance or even a huge capacity, but what they provide is a, a location where you can actually store highly condensed, valuable information, uh, such as publications, movies, scripts, small amounts of data that maybe don't fit into a normal journal um, format, but it gives you a place where you can post it and actually reference it with some guarantee that it's going to be around for a long time and, and, and in a way that you can then ha you have a URL that you can point to as a reference in a publication that most journals will accept. And so this is actually very nice. I was advising a student recently and we posted some movies here. And it was a very nice place to post these larger movies that he could then just reference in his thesis. And then finally, there's you and your resources. Typically, it'll be a desktop or a laptop that you need to connect to all of these over on um, an internet. And, but you're um, free to access any and all of these. And so there's a lot of ni nice resources across campus. Here's a table of what I've been talking about for the most part. Um, and basically the takeaway here is that for the most part, MSI's focus is on HPC, high performance computing and larger volumes of data, higher bandwidth. Whereas OIT's focus is more on um, a modicum of storage that's really designed for backups of desktop type and then also document, desktop document type materials such as Google Drive. Um, an aspect that I did not talk about is protected data um, and the HIPAA and, and pr um, personal data. And that is a work in progress. It's complicated because of the, all of the laws and um, you know, best practice guidelines it, that are in place, especially for medical protected data. However, we are making progress along those lines and we're putting together a cluster that's designed to work with protected data, primarily for the medical schools. And so that's in the offing this year. The details are still in the works, but um, it's coming and it's needed. So um, with that, that's sort of the overview, except for one um, more thing, which is the network that we have here, the, the glue that um, ties all of this together. So there's the um, one giggy network, which is in place and has been for quite a few years. The new development is the Gopher Science Network, which is upgrading all of this to at least 10 giggy, 10 giggy or higher. Um, this is not something that uh, an end user would casually get. There's real costs involved that usually a department or a center can easily afford. You need the system that's able to handle 10 gigabits a second. Um, you know, sustained. You need the 10 giggy NIC network interface card, as well as paying for the line that comes into the building. Um, more and more of the campus is being um, facilitated with this, though. 
And the thing that I personally find exciting about it is that as more and more units get on this higher and dedicated science network, the opportunities for um, finding new ways of analyzing data grow combinatorially. And mixing together perhaps data that's coming from an instrument in a lab with repositories that are available across the internet to um, MSI's HPC resources. And so that's what's going to be really fun and exciting moving forward is that you'll be able to move your data back and forth more freely at a higher bandwidth and in more automated ways. And we're here to help you do that. So we're very interested in projects that really require that. So in all of this, as a summary of this overview, before we get into MSI's resources, the best solutions that you're going to have will depend on the nature of your data and what you're doing with it. And so you have to answer a few questions, so think about these questions, in order to come up with really good decisions for how you manage your data. And it will have to do with the volume of the data, how much it's fragmented, how frequently you use it, and so forth. This is something that we can help you with, but the, um, the point here is that one solution doesn't fit all. However, we have a variety of solutions, and the trick is then finding the really good fit to your workflow and your data. Which finally brings me to, more specifically, MSI's role in all of this. Basically, we are here to help. Um, if you've got um, a large volume of data, and um, it's vast in any respect in terms of being very complex, very large just in the capacity needed to stage it, or it requires HPC resources to process it, um, then MSI may be in a very good position to help. We have the expertise, the hardware, and the software to manage that. Um, and so in fact, that is our mission, is to basically enable HPC applications. That's our mission in the, in the context of the university. I added this one last cliche at the end here, that we're all in this together, because it is very relevant to this conversation. It's relevant in several respects. First of all, our success is based on your success. So please feel free that if you have issues or problems, come to us. See, you can always email help at msi.umn.edu. And we are always happy to help you look at your workflow and find a really good fit with the resources that are available. It should get your research up and going if you run into a bottleneck. Um, and your success feeds back on everyone else's success, too, really, because to the extent that your research effort is successful, and MSI perhaps can help you land grants, which of course leads to overhead and support that way. It helps the prestige of the university and it helps us with our mandate moving forward. But beyond this social aspect that we're all in it together, there is a technical aspect that's really important to keep in mind when you're looking at uh, workflows where you're really beginning to scale up and stress the capacity of the system. What's really true and a really uh, underlying factor that is very important to keep in mind is that if you are beginning to run into the limits of the system so that you are, um, your workflow is hitting the limits of what it can do uh, uh, for a given way that you're approaching it, then you're not only, you're typically taxing the system to the point where um, you're slowing yourself down and you're slowing everyone else down. So what that means reflexively is anything that you do that speeds up your own workflow will speed everyone else's workflow up. And I'm not just saying this so that we try to develop a culture where we're trying to help each other, which is off, it's obviously good. But what I am saying is there are things that you can unilaterally do to help yourself. And it will naturally help everyone else. And it is not an accident, because it's just the nature of high-performance computing. When you scale up, you don't need 10% more capacity. You need 100% more capacity, or 1,000% more capacity. 
you can't get that by getting a larger fraction of the system. You can get 100 or 1,000 times more performance by using the system more efficiently. And that's the critical takeaway here, just generally, for this talk. And the, the rest of this talk is what we have available and how you can use it to actually, in fact, get the most out of the system. OK? So storage at MSI and how to use it. So I'll go start with a review of uh, the um, various storage systems we have here. Um, starting with the, um, the shared file system, PANFS, that's where your home directories are, to the tier two storage, um, CEPH, it's an object-oriented store. Um, it's accessed by file, but it's much higher performance and um, effectively, and, um, and much, much larger capacity that you have available there. Uh, then there's the tier three storage, which is basically um, tape archive. And then I'll talk a bit about um, the local disks and RAM disks, which are great places to stage um, work um, parts of your workflow that can give you much, much better throughput. And I'll have in my use cases examples of that. So starting with the, um, the shared file system, PANFS. It is a POSIX compliant file system. And so it is our most flexible and what you might think of as standard kind of storage. Your home directories are under here, your group shared directories are under here, as well as a variety of other spaces, um, which I'll discuss briefly. Um, but being POSIX compliant means that any standard application will be able to run on it and do normal file system style I.O. POSIX is a standard that most applications, solution suites, libraries, um, are written to um, support. And so um, this makes it very flexible. It means that desktop applications that you may be used to on, y on your laptop or your desktop in your department, if we can port them to our systems, will just run in terms of the file system, no problem. Um, the scope is um, basically that it's uh, visible everywhere on all of our s um, systems, which makes it a very nice glue for a common place where data can go and then you can access it from your batch jobs or from your interactive sessions or even from the Windows platform. Um, and you can access it with all the standard Linux commands on our Linux systems as well as every application that we have supported there. The namespace looks like this, that it'll always start with slash home, and then uh, the next tier is the user group that you're a part of, the name of the user group on the system. And then, um, and then there's several um, spaces under this. One is your home directory, which will start with your username. And then you can have any uh, directory tree under that, make it where you can make your own directories and organize your data and your work however you like. There is a shared um, group space. So under group, there is a shared. And this is a great place to put data and scripts um, that you want to share across your research group, but keep private from everyone else. Um, and then there's a public space where it's the natural place to put things that you want to share with other groups or perhaps everyone across um, the institute, if, if that's the model that your um, group is going towards. Um, and also, it's a great place to uh, put scripts or programs that you want user support to look at if you're uncomfortable with them going into your home directory. So it's a place where you can share data, programs, and so forth. Um, then there is global um, scratch. Let's see. That was another repository here. Let's see, where did I? Yeah. Then there's global scratch. Um, and, and that's shared across all groups. It um, has a lot of capacity and can be a convenient place to stage a huge amount of data. The caution, though, is that 
It's, vis it's open to all groups, and it's also open to jobs that are running in the background. And because there are so many applications running very highly fragmented I.O. to this file system, it can oftentimes be very, very slow. And so that's a caution. Um, it's sometimes even unusably slow, uh, just simply because there are so many codes that are all hammering on it. And that's as a part of the reason why I was emphasizing that there are techniques that you can unilaterally do that can get around this. And there are other places you can stage your data where you can get much, much, much better performance. And I'll be illustrating how you do that. Then there's tier two storage. And this is, um, uh, as opposed to being POSIX compliant from the point of view of the user, this is um, object-oriented storage. And so part of what that means is you don't just simply run an application that just does random access reads to it. Instead, you have to access it by file with special utilities for either pulling or pushing the data to or from tier two storage. It adds, so therefore it adds one more hoop to jump through to access it. However, because of that, it's much more performant and it's much less expensive per byte. And as a result, we can afford to give you almost an order of magnitude more storage on this system for free than you can on the Panassas file system, which is much more functional, shall we say. Um, and so that's the trade-off there. And also illustrate how you can um, put um, access to tier two storage into workflows and get much, much better throughput than you ever could off of the Panassas shared file system. Not because the Panassas shared file system is not provisioned well, it's only because when you're running on Panassas, you're, you're, running at, you're competing against batch jobs that are running tens of thousands of clients that are all doing fragmented I.O. to it, and that loads down the system a lot. By contrast, tier two storage has none of that going on because you can't. And as a result, you can get much better bandwidth with big granular reads. And that's a good strategy to follow if you have a very large volume of data to process. Um, and the ways you can access this is um, through um, S3 CMD type commands, so you can get and put um, data. Uh, there you have a, um, a URL here uh, that basically goes into some detail for how you can um, access tier two storage, not only from our Linux systems using Linux commands like S3 CMD, but also um, over the web. And that's a nice feature that we have with, the, with this S3 type storage is that it's as you can actually post data there and share it as a URL. The namespace looks like this, where it's S3 colon slash slash, and then it'll have a bucket name. And this bucket, the, the namespace for the buckets is shared across all users. So I recommend when you create a bucket name, you start with your username to help guarantee that it will be unique. Um, and then there'll be a file name. Now, buried in uh, the bucket name can be many forward slashes. And so it can actually look like and mirror a file system that's off of, a, the off, say, from your home directory. And so there, in fact, there are S3 CMD sync type commands that will sync whole directory trees very easily to um, tier two storage. And you will get um, a set of buckets that mirror your directory paths, even though they're, s they're completely separate buckets. But that's perfectly fine. And, it, and there are automated ways of um, going through those, just as if it were a directory tree. Um, let's see. So are there any questions on this so far? OK. Um, then there's third tier storage. And this is a, uh, the tape option that we, you have as a user. So these are not the archival tapes that we manage to just for disaster recovery. These are tapes you can purchase, your research group can purchase, that gives you a longer term storage um, and really much more capacity I if that's what you need. But it's at the cost of being much more granular in its access. 
And so these are LTO7 tapes, um, which gives you up to 15 um, terabytes of storage, depending on how much your data compresses. And um, they're sold, sold in units of two tapes so that are completely redundant. It's mirror storage just so that um, there's um, a much, much higher chance that you won't lose any data there. Um, and, um, and it's, so you can get, you know, upwards of like 30 terabytes of storage for under $1,000, basically, the two sets of, of two tapes, for example. Um, this is something that um, your, your research group has to do and, um, and so you'd start by sending help, uh, email to help at msi.umn.edu to set up a contract and purchase these tapes. Because when you get these tapes, you're not just buying tapes, you're buying a service which manages these tapes. They're in a tape library, which means you can automatically access them in scripts and such. It means that you have a way of listing everything that you've got on these tapes, and you don't have to be mounting the tapes yourself. We found this is the most cost-effective and performant way of providing tape archive to end users because if we were to sell you the tapes and you were to take them and put them on your own shelf, then it's, it's much more staff time to reintegrate them back into our system because then we have to handle all the edge cases of all the different technologies of where those tapes might be coming from or what may have happened to them. Whereas if we keep them in our own tape library, this we can make a whole lot of assumptions that improve reliability, performance, and greatly lower the cost. And so that's the reason why it's organized this way. So this tape, tape archives are available, but for a fee. Then there are databases and web services that are available at at um, the institute here and across campus. Historically, we uh, supported these on a per project basis. We still do provide support, but we've moved now for OIT to actually support the hardware for um, standing up a database. But they won't provide you with any um, expertise for configuring or managing that database. Our application development team here at the, the um, MSI can help you. And again, this is something that you need to work as a, as a, a cooperative agreement with MSI. Um, but it is, there is help available if your group needs to move in that direction. Otherwise, there are existing databases which are available that your um, research group may be accessing either on campus or off, and they can be very flexible and convenient ways of getting data and then accessing and, and managing data. And so you'd um, use it through a URL and the namespace would look basically something like this for um, any given user application supported through MSI. Um, but uh, the capacity, the cost, and the way it's organized will all be on a per project basis because this is, a, this is much more of a specialty. I just wanted to let you know that it's available in principle, and so we can, if you need it, we can talk. Okay, then more practically, what you have available immediately for your workflows, though, and this is going in another direction, is local disk. And so this is a great place for staging data that you um, are going to run on an application um, and especially if your application does highly fragmented I.O., which many applications do, you'll see much better bandwidth and much better throughput by staging your data to local disk. Um, and part of the reason why is a lot of applications that are out there were written, in fact, to run efficiently and uh, off of local disk, but off of a f shared file system, um, which has many more which can have much greater latency getting to the end data, they may be doing much more, fragment, much more highly fragmented I.O. that can be efficiently supported on a shared file system with literally tens of thousands of clients hammering on it. By contrast, 
the nature of a local disk is that it's completely local to the system and it has more of, more of a traditional file system cache. And so that means when you go to access one bit or one byte from your file, a whole page will get cached in the memory and it's likely to stay there and be available for the next read. And so um, many applications, especially on Linux, will automatically use file system cache um, because it's just a part of the file system itself and, um, and get very good performance that way. And so you'll find that oftentimes by staging your data on the local disk, which is um, always available on a Linux system, you can get much better performance. So again, this is POSIX compliant uh, storage. Um, and the only real limitations are that it is much smaller in capacity than your home storage, about a half a, you know, half a terabyte at most. And um, it's local to the, the, the node that's running on it. So you have to copy data there during the lifetime of, say, a job that you're running in a, in a workflow. The namespace looks like this, where you have um, scratch local. And then um, if you're sharing the node in a job with, with many jobs running on it, it's usually a good idea to put your username as a part of the path just to ensure that it's going to be distinct. And then you can organize uh, the directory tree under that anywhere you like. Um, otherwise, it's going to look exactly like um, storage under your home directory. The thing to keep in mind is its lifetime is only during the lifetime of the job that you have access to the node, and its scope is only, um, only that node can see it. Okay? But, it, but it because of those restrictions, you can oftentimes get much better performance off of this. RAM disk, very similar in its semantics, and even better in performance, but more limited in storage. So with RAM disks, again, it's local to the node. Um, and you're, re you're really literally using the memory on the node. And it's shared with the memory of the applications that are running there. And so you're limited to half the, um, the disk space on that node. Um, and so, for example, for a standard Masabi compute node with 64 gigabytes of memory, you have no more than 32 gig of available space. But it's going to give you the best performance, both lowest latency and highest bandwidth that you're, you're ever going to see for POSIX I.O. here at the Institute. And so that can be really worthwhile and can make a major difference in the, the, your throughput. The, so, and I'll illustrate how to use this in one of our use cases. So here is um, a somewhat more detailed uh, table, and I've, I'm not going to go through all these numbers in detail here, um, but it's from the point of view of a standard Masabi compute node, um, and uh, starting from the file system cache, working way up through um, memory, system memory, local disk, SSDs, and, um, and the PANFS file systems, tier two storage, I have uh, capacity that's available in rough, you know, in detailed numbers as we're on the, on the node itself to rough numbers that are always growing um, and will depend to some extent on your environment. But also we have the bandwidth, latencies and bandwidth. Um, and these are all real numbers in the sense that not only do they correspond to the um, speci hardware specifications, now they're not to exceed numbers, basically, given for the given hardware, but they also are numbers that I've been able to achieve, either directly or indirectly, in applications. Um, and so these are real hard numbers that you can actually achieve in a real application. Um, and you can see that they vary by very many orders of magnitude, both in terms of bandwidth and latency. And so the takeaway here is that there is a tremendous boost in performance you can get if you can, for example, reuse cache. That's generally known to be true in all parallel computing, and it's an important factor when you're designing the code itself for the application. Now, if you have applications that you're just using, you can still configure that even if you don't write a line of code, you can configure that application sometimes to 
limit the scope of the data it's looking at at any one time so that it will fit into, say, the 30 megabytes of cache on a compute node. And, and then you will see a substantial boost in performance. So even as an end user not writing a line of code, you can configure jobs sometimes to take advantage of cache reuse. Beyond that, I'm going to um, memory. Um, and in fact, the 32 gigabytes of memory that you'd have on a standard compute node are much larger on many of the nodes. The new Manji nodes typically have 256 gigabytes of memory, giving you 128 gig of, um, of RAM disk storage. So if you can stage your files or some subset of your files there for processing, you can realize much better performance. And so forth as you go up the memory hierarchy, seeing poorer and poorer performance but larger capacities as you go up. And so the trick is you can um, uh, organize your workflows s to stage data into smaller chunks and, and see much better performance. And so that's something we can work on. We're happy to help you with if it's, if it's a bottleneck for you. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why are you using this type of Okay. Like Good question. Excellent question, in fact. And uh, this table is sort of addressing that to some extent. You don't have to. So, uh, so the, f the simplest answer to your question is you don't have to use the, um, the RAM disk or the local disk. You will, your program will function off of your home directory in exactly the same way. So it's a very good point. However, it may or may not um, be losing performance because of bandwidth to disk. Okay. I'll okay. actually. So I think this is the best way. But for me, the setup I see is a memory station than a disk station. It can be, but not the RAM disk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I yeah. understand the RAM disk. Yeah, but yeah. My, my question is to choose the local disk as the best option. Okay. And, that, and that's a, a good point. Good eyes. Um, in fact, the load, you're absolutely right. The PanFS in principle can have lower latency, especially if you're the only person on the system. But because it's shared, sometimes you can have much, much higher latency. And we, people will see that. People will even see interactive sessions of just running VI, you know, like a, a simple text editor, um, will have substantial lag time just bringing up the file. So it, it's sporadic, to be sure. There's another aspect to it, too, which is what I mentioned earlier, which is has to do with file system cache. File system cache behaves very differently on a local disk than on a shared file system. And so um, the, that first bit that you get may be always slower off of a local disk, but the next bit that you ask for will usually be much faster because it'll then be coming actually from memory because it'll p stage that page of memory in, you know, from disk into memory, basically. So um, it depends on how it's accessing um, the file system. So there are trade-offs. And it really depends on your application as to whether or not these, these will be of issue. Some applications that can read um, disk efficiently in, in large blocks, say, and then pr spend a lot of time processing it in memory, it may not need any of this. You can just go straight off your home directory just as you're saying, and it'll be just fine. But many applications, especially the, the ones off the shelf that you're liable to be using, unless you're developing the application yourself, um, many of the standard applications, they were written for a local disk, and they run just fine there, but when you put them on the shared file system, especially if it's a very busy shared file system like ours, um, they can oftentimes run much, much slower. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, sure, yeah. But you're absolutely right. You don't have to do it, and it, it will depend on the application. And that's a very good point, so I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, 
So we get to um, the um, interfaces for the software you use to access all of this storage. And I'm going to start with the basic, the basic applications you use to move data onto and off of our file systems. Um, going from secure copy to uh, wget. So secure copy is just one of the sim simplest standard Linux ways of copying data between hosts. Um, wget is a great way to pull data from a uh, website if it's configured to support it. There are git, um, there's git for githubs and the university supports that very well. And that's a great way of sharing data and projects um, with, with a group of people or even a community. Um, S3 CMD is the standard Linux command for accessing our tier two storage. I'll be illustrating that a bit. And then Globus, um, which is really the best way for moving really vast amounts of data between centers. Uh, the centers have to be provisioned for this, but you can actually run a Globus endpoint on your laptop um, and, and then move data to and from a, a center that has Globus from your laptop back and forth and manage data that way. Um, so to begin with, I'm going to assume that you logged into um, a Linux system at MSI. Um, generally, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're not coming in from the campus, from within campus, you have to go through the university VPN to access our systems, and then you would log in. You can log in through a, a login node, NX or NICE. Okay, and so given that, you can log in to um, our standard bastion host, login.msi.umn.edu, um, and then from there, you can use SCP. We have an SCP client that's staged and ready for you to use on any Linux shell, um, and it really relies on there being an, um, an SCP um, or an SSH type services on the host that you're talking to. Typically, a Linux system that's managed here at the university will support that. Then um, what you can do is um, it's always organized from, you list the um, source of the data first and then the destination second. Um, so for example, if you're moving copying data to MSI from an MSI host you know, and you're logged on to an MSI host, then you'd list the remote host first with the user, the, the name of the remote host, and then the path on that remote host, um, and then copying it to a local path um, that's, say, under your home directory. The dash R flag can be used. Um, to, if you don't use the dash R flag, it will do individual files. With the dash R flag, it'll do it recursively through entire directory trees. So it's an easy way to copy entire directories over. Similarly, you can push data out and just flips the order. So, very simple. GitHub's, uh, let's see, I was with get, um, wget, that's just a very convenient way you can pull data from your, um, a website, as I mentioned, and you just use it with wget URL. The website has to be configured to support this kind of a thing. But many repositories um, will support that. And um, it's a, this is, again, a, another Linux command that you'll always have available on our, on our systems that um, make it easy to pull data from repositories to, uh, to operate on. There are more uh, um, lavish ways you can access GitHub type repositories and the university supports them quite well. They're a great place to um, s manage software projects and even data and share it across the campus and across communities. And so there's, um, you'd access it at this URL and there's extensive documentation here for um, setting yourself up with GitHub. It's a very nice way to manage um, software projects, um, especially if you, you have many people contributing. And uh, in terms of Linux commands, there's a variety of Git commands for committing and uh, adding to projects locally once you have it set up. I'm not going to go into the details here. I just want to point, point to these URLs so uh, that'll help you get started 
Um, and then if you have, if you need more help than that, we're we're here to help, especially for running it off of MSI system. Then there's uh, the tier two storage, Ceph. And the S3 CMD command is what you typically use on our Linux systems. And I'm emphasizing all of these Linux commands primarily to begin with, because these, is what, these are what you would use in an automated workflow running in any of our batch queues. Because you're going to find yourself in a batch queue in a Linux environment using command line type um, applications to move data around as well as process it. And so the S3 CMD command, again, is a, a Linux command. It's a command that you can just type at the, your command line. And you can not only can run it interactively, but you can run it in a shell script, and you can run it in a batch job. And it will work on any of our compute nodes. And so that means it allows you to pull or push data to or from tier two storage in an automated way from batch jobs. And it can be very handy that way. The um, kinds of things you can do is like you can make a bucket, then B command. You can put data to it, pull data from it, and um, list the data that are, that's in a given bucket. And we have extensive documentation at this URL here. Um, and it not only includes these S3 CMD commands, but also ways that you can access the, um, your buckets over the web and how you can configure it so that you can share it you can see it from your laptop or share it with other people um, or share data in such a way that they can, they can access it as a URL and, for example, use wget to pull the data. So it's a great way of sharing data as well as storing larger volumes of data. And then finally, Globus, for in terms of data migration, is really great for um, moving really large volumes of data. And it has all the properties that I want to see when I'm moving really vast amounts of data between centers. It runs in the background. You can set up a transfer of a very huge amount of data with just a few mouse clicks. Um, it has a nice graphical user interface and also a command line for driving it if you, if you prefer that. Um, it does retries. So um, it doesn't assume that the connection is going to be perfect or up all the time. So it will keep retrying until it moves all the data across. Um, and it will do checksums to ensure that the data gets across accurately. So when it finally says all the data is moved, you know that you have a copy of the data that you can trust and then and proceed. So it really has a lot of good properties working for it. One of the biggest issues um, that the Globus community faced early on when they're setting it up is how you authenticate all of this. Because they actually set up a system that could keep retrying as if a totally dedicated staff member kept logging into the, each of the systems and, and querying how far has the copies moved and instigating new ones at, at need. It's all done for you, but it has to keep re-authenticating in and it uses certificates to do that. And so for this reason, the, the systems have to be provisioned for supporting Globus complete with this certificate authentication, as well as the hardware and the servers and the connect connectivity to the network to support all of this. The U University of Minnesota has a lot of Globus endpoints. In fact, we have a, a license with Globus. And so we have more support from Globus and that includes some nice properties, including the fact that your university ID gives you a Globus account automatically. You can get one just for the applying for it, but it's convenient to go through your university ID to authenticate into Globus, because oftentimes servers on campus will then uh, all recognize you're already authenticated in, and it makes it e a bit easier on some of the um, endpoints to activate the endpoints and get them going. To use this, you would start at the Glo general Globus URL. So clicking to this, you're going to get a, webs uh, uh, a landing website that's something like this. It's changed in its appearance quite a bit. In fact, most of the menus have changed quite a bit since I um, made these slides but the functionality and the semantics of how you use it is all the same. 
Um, and at the time, um, as over a quarter, you know, over almost 300 petabytes uh, that they had moved, and since then it's been much, much larger, and they don't even mention the, the number yet. It just became ridiculously large. But to get started, once you go to the URL website, you basically log in. And as I said, you, um, if you go in through the University of Minnesota domain, you can use your university ID to authenticate in, and uh, that'll actually help you get going. Um, the landing um, page for the login will look something like this, but you will have, you won't of course have the University of Minnesota selected the first time you go to it. Instead, you'll need to select it by going to this pull down, and you'll see an enormous number of domains. And the e easiest, by far, the easiest way to get to University of Minnesota is to just start typing. And before you get to the second N in Minnesota, you'll uniquely select University of Minnesota. You can then select that and hit continue. And then, if your browser isn't so, um, already authenticated in, uh, then typically you'll need to do this to set up your authentication with the certificates. You'll come to the University Sibyllith, where you'll authenticate in with your University X500 ID. This is your standard university ID that you use for your emails. Um, and now there's two-factor authentication, so be sure you have your second factor available, usually calling your smartphone or an app on it. Um, and once you get past that, you're authenticated in to the Globus website. And again, these menus will look somewhat differently, but the semantics is all the same. And in order to instigate a transfer then, you have to select two endpoints which correspond to the two different sites or the two different hosts that you want to move data between. So you select the first, and suppose you want to move data, say, from your O2, your um, home directory under MSI. Again, you're going to see a daunting number of endpoints that are available. Um, one thing to remember is that UMN is going to be the starting um, string for virtually all of the University of Minnesota endpoints. UMN MSI will get you to a shorter list of um, uh, the endpoints that are supported here at MSI. And you'll see home, tier two, tier three for the tape storage that you can actually access through this and so forth. Um, and, um, and so basically, the easiest thing to do is just start typing um, UMN MSI, and then you can select the, um, the endpoint. Select the endpoint there. And then you might have to log in again, but um, I think the IDs now are unique between MSI and the University of Minnesota. They're fully supported, so you may not even need to go through the second um, authentication. But even if you do, you only need to do it once, and then you'll be authenticated in, usually for about a week, um, is the, the lifetime of the certificates. And then you'll see a browser-type window that shows your home directory, that you can uh, go, uh, there's file folders, and you can um, hierarchically go through your files and select them for, for moving. It takes two to tango for um, moving data, so you need to select the second endpoint. And here I just typed in the um, uh, endpoint over in physics. And that um, brings me to a file system that they set up there specifically for handling larger data. Um, and then, let's see. So um, the example for that I have for um, that I first tried was a simple little project where I was doing a parameter space study using OpenFOAM, a fluid, sim a fluid simulator. And I was looking at flow down a pipe, a turbulent flow along a pipe. And so I did a whole bunch of parameter space studies. So I had about a dozen different directories, each one of which was one set of parameters. And then in that each one of those directories, I had the typical OpenFOAM style way of organizing projects, which is all file-based. And so there's multiple file um, directories 
for um, defining the system, data sets that are produced, and so forth. So in one of the data set, for example, di directories, I stored snapshots, a couple of dozen snapshots, and then in each one of those, it had um, data uh, of the d all the data that I asked for output during the simulations, resulting in hundreds of directories and thousands of files, but not much data. A very tiny amount of data, in fact. Um, but this was a nice way to illustrate how easy it is to move a really complicated directory tree, um, very irregular, and just you know, many, many, many files. So all I did was I browsed to that pipe directory, and then I selected a directory um, to move it to, and clicked go, basically to share, um, copy the data. Ephemerally, a um, a notification came up so that the, uh, this request for this transaction was received. That basically just confirms that the mouse click worked. It will disappear after a few seconds, but what you can always go to is look at the, um, the, the manage the transfers, and that brings you to a page that looks something like this, which has all of the transfer requests that you had submitted. By the time I had um, taken the screenshots for these slides, this tiny little transfer of data had already completed, so I had actually a check, a green check, meaning it was done. I could, but whether or not it's done, you can go to the pull down over here and see the details of how far it's gotten, and in this case, it, it completely copied all the data over. Um, not at a very great bandwidth, but that's because it was not very much data and it was tiny little files but it didn't take much time. So that was um, a nice result. Other tests where I moved uh, um, substantially more data over to physics, um, just you know, 32 files and over 200 gig of data, um, that gave me about 88 megabytes a second bandwidth. That's somewhat better, but not really great bandwidth. When we dug into it, we realized that the um, the endpoint over in physics just wasn't provisioned for that high a bandwidth. They didn't have that large, a beefy enough a server, but they didn't really need it. Um, for really large transfers between major centers, say between MSI and um, NCSA at the time, I tried another similar size transfer. This actually was across thousands of files, but a similar volume of data, and I actually was sustaining over 300 megabytes, uh, 300 megabytes a second. And so um, the upshot is, is you can get very good bandwidth and you can manage really large volumes of data transferred this way. Questions on any of this? Okay. And a nice thing about um, Globus is that um, you, you don't have to keep monitoring that, the, that menu to see if it's done. It will send you an email at the end um, telling you um, the status and, 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 and when it's complete. Okay, so if there's, um, are there any questions so far in regards to um, any of the utilities we have here at MSI? Otherwise, I'll go on to examples of workflows and how you can use these utilities and systems um, to do um, some interesting projects. So the first example is a cross operating system workflow. The example I have, and I help support fluid dynamics um, software generally here at MSI, and one of the major tools we have uh, for the engineering community especially is ANSYS. It's a, a standard solution suite. It's feature rich, and um, it really su wonderfully supports really complicated geometries, multi-physics, with complicated constitutive relationships um, and can handle really sophisticated simulations. It's intended for engineers to use in real world applications. And as a result, the inputs are very rich and complicated, starting with the geometry of the problem, which can be really complicated, and how you mesh it up. For that reason, they have a wonderful graphical user interface under their ANSYS workbench for supporting really rich kinds of input. And this is not unique. There's lots of solution solvers out there for even engineering problems like Gambit and, um, and um, 
console that is similar in nature. And then there's also lots of chemistry packages and lots of other packages that rely on graphical user interfaces. But what seems to be common among many of the commercial um, graphical user interfaces is that they were written originally for Windows. And they run extremely well under Windows, but the th typically what you'll have is a third-party port to Linux systems that's extraordinarily fragile because of all of the changes you needed to make to go from wi a Windows system with DCOM and ActiveX and all of the, fr the frameworks for graphics and user uh, and parallel applications that run well under Windows, that all has to be ported to something like X11 and um, socket-based um, clouds of applications running under Linux that is awkward at best, awkward and slow, and that's very, very, very fragile. And as a result, the graphical user interfaces for ANSYS, as well as many other Windows-centric applications, don't run that well under Linux, even if they run at all. But Windows systems that we have typically aren't HPC. For getting the resources of more memory, more cores, and running in parallel across a cluster, you really need to use the um, Linux clusters for that. And um, applica uh, applications like ANSYS, their solvers run extremely well on our Linux systems. So to bridge the gap between the user control that really needs Windows and the performance uh, running it in parallel on Linux systems, the, um, the file system actually turns out to be the glue that works very well for that kind of an application. And so what you can do is we do have, through OIT, Windows remote desktops that you can run Windows graphical user interfaces. You're never going to get much in terms of HPC performance on that, but you will get a really good end user experience for the user interface. It will support that graphics and the, the mouse clicks and the selection boxes really, really well, which is what exactly what you want during that phase of defining the problem. Then you can save that data, in the case of ANSYS, you save case and data, to your home directory under Panassis, which is visible on these OIT on Windows platforms. Then you can go to the Linux systems and then run batch jobs to solve the problem. And when that finishes, you can go back to the Windows platform to look at the results. So you get the best of both worlds. And that's the way I, I recommend using ANSYS products because everybody needs to use the graphical user interface to set up the problem. But, um, and everybody runs into problems on our Linux system, usually. Um, and this is a good solution to get it. So it's a simple thing, but it's very effective. The other example I have is um, a data intensive workflow. And this is going to probably be more relevant to people who are, have um, really large data sets that they're really processing the data and they need to do it in pipelines and workflows. Um, here, the, um, the idea is that we have a large volume of data that you need to process. And maybe it's large compared to your group quota. Maybe it's larger than your group quota. Um, also, um, you need to access the data in many ways and you need to have really good bandwidth in order to get very good throughput. Oops. Okay. Um, so um, the issue then is that how do you manage all this data and how do you get good performance? Um, especially if you're bottlenecking because um, one, the data just doesn't fit in your group allocation and two, you find that the um, the home directories aren't giving you the performance you, you're hoping for. The solution is to um, stage the data in bulk on Ceph where you have much more storage capacity and much higher bandwidth pulling the data in, stage it if it will fit onto a local disk or RAM disk, ideally, and process it there and then copy the results either back to Ceph if it's large volumes of data that are the output, 
or if it's a very small amount of data, you can even just copy it to your home directory. And I'll illustrate how to do that. And it ties in seamlessly with a mini workshop that I have that I developed for people who were beginning to exceed their, um, their, gr uh, their group quotas. There was a time when we, uh, before we had started imposing the group quotas at a 10 terabyte limit globally, um, that there are too many groups that were asking, um, expanding to for more data than we could afford to stage. We couldn't, we could not afford as an institute to accommodate them, and they needed more. And so the solution that we found that really works for them, and I think it will work for you if you need to really scale up the volumes of data you need to handle, all has the same strategies involved. And the idea is, if you really have vast quantities of data, then you want to manage the data in a way that has your workflow in mind. Because that'll make your life much easier, it'll make the access to the data much more efficient, and I'll illustrate how that works with this, with this one example. Um, and this is really a sales pitch, so I um, have catchwords. But I really mean each one of these catchwords in terms of it being easy, reliable, fast, and flexible. Um, and I'm going to illustrate in this, in this one case how it worked for me from my own application and how I've been helping set up users to do this for their applications as well. And in fact, it's a very lightweight framework. It's, it's really more, I'm selling not an application or, e or software, but just an idea of how you might approach managing really large workflows. And the idea is starting with, starts with the notion of a data hierarchy again, but this is not so much the hardware hierarchy, it's the software and conceptual hierarchy that you would have as an end user, starting with a project level. So this is, this is all in human terms, in terms of um, the project is like a thesis project or a project associated with a grant. Um, and within that project, you might have one or more large data sets that you want to manage. And then for each one of the data sets, the argument I'm making is it's very handy to divide up your data set into an enumeration of what I call items. And this is a bit of an abstraction between the data set and the final files that exist someplace like on disk. And the reason why is because if you divide up your data set into an enumeration of items so that, that cover every bit of data that you uh, need to handle, then it gives you a simple way of sweeping through all that data for everything from moving it around to um, doing the processing on it. And even if you have, if you have it fits perfectly if you have an embarrassingly parallel workflow for each item can be done individually and in isolation. That, reach the, that leads to perfect parallelism. But even if you have a more complicated um, kind of a workflow where you need to cross compare items, maybe all pairs, um, an enumeration still works because then you can do all the cross pairs of items and then do all cr um, cross turns between any pair of items and it gives you a natural way to sweep through all pairwise or, or for that matter, any n-tuple of items. So it's, it can be very flexible. Under each item, then, is a, a set of names, and I'm calling them names as opposed to files, because the names will really correspond to the data that's in the file. But the file may be staged on Tier 2. It might be on Panassis. It may be in some data repository someplace else. And so it's nice to have that um, flexibility. Um, and so this is the sort of a conceptual hierarchy that, it, that labels things that I'll be talking about and how this strategy for managing data works. They, within a data set, you'll also keep track of locations of where the data might be, um, and then as, as well as some scripts uh, for utility scripts for automatically um, managing the data, okay? So the example at hand, then, is a magnetohydrodynamic um, fluid simulation I did a while back. 
um, in collaboration with the um, Tom Jones as a group in astronomy. It's a, it's a simulation that was done on a billion cells, 1,000 cells on a side, keeping track of seven primary variables, density, three components of velocity, three components of magnetic field. And the stored saved disk in four byte fields. And so that leads to 28 gigabytes per snapshot. And with 82 snapshots, it's a fair, fair amount of data. Um, the each snapshot is written out in eight pieces. And this was done for parallel I.O. You'll oftentimes see this, that it's handy to have multiple files for a given snapshot. In this case, I write, write out eight for every snapshot. That leads to um, a directory where all the data landed that looks something like this, and this is only showing a small fraction of it. And the total volume is uh, uh, over two and, a uh, two and a half terabytes and over 600 files. And so I don't want to look at every single one of these files by hand. I don't want to check to see if they're all there. Um, I don't want to have to deal with these as individual files. I want a way of automatically processing these files, even if I were going to leave them in this directory. But especially if I'm going to use tier two storage, which adds this extra layer, it's nice to have a framework that allows me to access them in some automated fashion. So I put together a very, very lightweight set of scripts, bash shell scripts, that do this for me. And really the glue that puts it all together is just a tiny little file that basically keeps track of just a little bit of metadata, just the data of where the data, uh, so it's the information that like the directory of where the data first landed, or the bucket in the, on tier two where um, I want to move the data back and forth between or, s or access it from. Um, and this keeps track of these big long paths that have everything to do with our own peculiarities of our own file system and nothing to do with what you want to see. <laughs> Um, generally, but it keeps track of them for you so that you never need to look at that again. And I find that very handy, not only because I don't want to type strings that long, but because I might not remember them. Um, finger fumble as I'm typing it makes it frustrating to type a string that long. Um, and so having a, just a little bit of a standard way of recording where the data lands on a per data set basis can make life much, much easier. And you can implement this in a database. Here I'm doing it in a simple flat file. There's lots of ways you can do this. I'm not saying one is better than another. It's just the concept that here's a very simple thing you can do. And as a result, I have like at this point many, uh, several dozen of these projects online at any one time. and. Um, I can go to, let's see, to define a data set, all I need to do is run a script, which I call available, and I give it, um, I go to the directory where the data is, I type in a available and then the a label for that data set, can come up with any label name I want, and then some kind of a description that describes what's in that data set that's meanif meaningful to me. Then at any, la any later date, if I just type available, and again, this is, this is just a simple Kluge script I wrote, but it illustrates just how easy this can be to implement. Um, I get a list of all the projects I've registered in this way. They just are all stored in simple little files that are under my home directory, under a dot .available directory. It's very simple. Um, and I get the description, so these, this is now a namespace I want to deal with. A nice short label that I can refer to, and then a, a description that's meaningful to me, and that which can be anything that I define. Um, then I can go to any directory when I want to process this, and then just type available, and then give that the label that points to that data set, and it sets up that directory with a small little metadata file so that automated scripts will automatically know where to look to access data. Um, one of the things that this allows is that I can write a, um, a, a batch job, a 
can shoot. I keep going forward. Like that. I can write a batch job that, um, that will automatically archive this. Um, and so it can be just as simple. I'm doing little more than asking resources, asking for resources, going into the directory where I've defined the project, and um, and then basically um, doing it, um, available S3 sync. And then this will automatically go through that enumeration of items as I talked about, realize all the file names that go correspond to each one of the items, and then move each one in turn, synchronizing it to tier two storage. And because it has once and for all decided the bucket name that it's going to, it will always go to the right place, or at least the consistent place that I've assigned to it. And it will always know where to look if I need to retrieve the data back. And I never need to type, I never needed to type anything in terms of that long path. And this took about a day to move all the data over, but it ran in the background and it happened automatically. I then have another script that relies on the enumeration that can list where the data exists currently. And one of the places on Global Scratch, and here I had by hand actually pulled all the data over with a simple S3CMD command, but I didn't use a sync command, I just used a straight pull. And as a result, um, because the, this Scratch file system was so slow at some points, some of the files didn't get across. And I didn't even realize it until I ran the summarize command. And then because the data was stored in this enumeration of items, it could automatically find for me that some were missing and where the data was complete. And so, and I didn't realize this just looking, just listing the directory because out of the 600 odd files, I would have had to have really good eyes to catch the few missing or incomplete files. So this, this turned out to be more handy than I thought it was going to be um, early on. Then to process the data and to do it at speed, you can do it off of a RAM disk. And so what you can do, what I did here, is I got a interactive session on a compute node. I went to the DevSHM, the, um, the RAM disk directory, and made a directory for myself. And then I defined the project here by just doing available, giving it the label. And then um, I can have another script that automatically uses the data that's in that small metadata file to automatically, by item number, pull all the data that goes together for one snapshot to this directory. And because it was coming from tier two storage and going straight onto a RAM disk to memory, I wasn't limited to by the the disk, the shared file system disk speeds, and I got actually fairly good bandwidth. It could also pull the eight pieces of the data in parallel. And so it pulled that 28 gigabytes over in about a minute. So that was a reasonable amount of t human time to wait to get that data staged. And then I have specialized scripts for looking at this data. Um, one of the things small pieces of metadata that are automatically pulled in whenever I define a project this way is a, a script for defining derived fields in terms of the raw fields. So I could, for example, get the total energy in terms of the total kinetic energy and the total magnetic energy, and then plot it up here. And I ran this illustration simply to force it to pull in all 28 gigabytes of data. It forced it to use all the fields to produce this visualization. And it did it in about 33 seconds. And um, I have some timers built into this code, and it spent 14 of those seconds pulling in um, the data. And this is phenomenally good bandwidth, simply because it's coming off of RAM disk. And that illustrates this point here, that it's something that I've been hammering about um, during this uh, tutorial, and that is that you're never going to beat the bandwidth or the latency off of RAM disk on any of our systems. Here I, I'm illustrating this uh, my, for my own application, my own post-processing code. Um, and I thought I had written it fairly efficiently in terms of disk access. On this particular data set, it was guaranteed to get two megabyte reads. And I'm told by people who configured the system that that should be a pretty efficient disk read. 
most dusty deck applications are going to give you much more highly fragmented I.O., that is, much shorter reads that jump around a lot more, and they'll be affected even more extremely than this. Even so, that 14 seconds on, uh, off of RAM disk became hundreds of seconds, upwards of a 2,000 seconds on the global scratch. Um, and even off my home directory, it was an order of magnitude slower, maybe 20 times slower. And it's not limited to my own application. I tried just as a sanity test, like um, DD, which is direct to disk, which does the simplest kind of block reads just to test things like bandwidth or copy files in the most raw, simplest way. Um, and the direct to disk going to dev null, basically, so it's just doing the reads off of these. You can see the variation in performance. Again, it's much, much slower off of your home directory or it's especially global scratch than off of a RAM disk. And even a MD5 checksum, similarly. So the, the takeaway from this slide is if the data can be staged off of RAM disk, your al almost any application is going to run much, much faster if it's I.O. intensive. And that's something for that you can benchmark for yourself, but it's something to keep in mind that can make a huge difference in many workflows. So using my little post-processing application, uh, for example, I can now interactively play with this data and in a matter of seconds do complicated analyses and comparisons of data. And I show this here because it will illustrate the final punchline of this, which is the actual parallel automated workflow that, the, um, that, can be auto, um, that you can use off of Tier 2 storage that actually gives you the, the good throughput and performance. So I'll, what I'm going to be looking at is, in fact, these three fields, the magnetic energy, the kinetic energy, and the uh, quantity and fluid dynamics, the vorticity, the c magnitude of the curl of velocity. Um, so three diagnostic quantities, and I want to do that as averages through the whole volume for every single snapshot, just to see what their time profiles look like. And that can be done um, using GNU Parallel and this framework that I was talking about. And so GNU Parallel is one of the nice ways you can very easily run embarrassingly parallel workflows like this one, where you have a whole bunch of independent items to, to work on. And all it does is really can take a sequence of numbers or items in a variety of formats and then use them as arguments to a shell script. And then so here, I've configured this job to run across four nodes um, and then run GNU Parallel to run one task on, or one parallel thread on each one of those nodes. That's what this, this, um, this does for you here. And then I have this PROC, P-R-O-C, script, which does the actual processing. It takes two arguments. One is the item number, as I've been calling it, which corresponds to the dump number of the um, fluid simulation. And the other one is just the task number, which is guaranteed to be unique, even if these item numbers were not. And the reason why I organized it that way in this processing script is so that I could have a totally unique number for defining a work directory where I would process the data. Because I wanted each, I wanted to guarantee that even if they're running on the same node, they would have a different directory as a work directory. So all it does then is it creates a work di under a directory under um, in the on the RAM disk, and then it, and it copies in the inputs that I'm going to use, the small inputs that are associated with this project, um, and then it um, copies the, the all the data associated with that one item into this directory, just as we showed I showed you interact is done interactively. And then it runs the analysis tool on um, uh, for each one of these fields, generating this Z profile, a vertical profile, um, for collecting the data together in a relatively small amount for, for later calculating whole volume averages. Um, and I, do, I touch this do not display flag. That's just specific to my own software for telling it not to actually pop up an X11 display because this is going to be run in the batch job, remember. So I don't want those displays coming up one per item. 
And then at the end, it cleans up by removing the entire work directory, thereby cleaning up the space and making room for the next um, data, next piece of data. So that's all there is to that script. And the punchline is that it processed all that data um, fairly efficiently. Um, it achieved over a gigabyte um, s a second sustained, and that's including the processing time. The, the, um, basically, this graph here shows along the horizontal axis time in seconds um, from the start of the job, and the vertical axis is the item number that it was working on. So each one of these horizontal bars correspond to the, the span of time that it was that the, the parallel job was working on that particular item. So you can see it marching through the items as GNU Parallel schedules it, just in order. Um, and there's quite a lot of overlap and quite, uh, quite a good bandwidth that was sustained for this parallel processing. And I can tell you you'll virtually never get this kind of bandwidth off of PANFS because it is shared across so many users and clients and parallel jobs that are hammering on it. And by contrast, this came from tier two storage to a RAM disk and could get much, much better throughput and gave me in the end the profiles, the three profiles I was after. So with that, uh, that uh, concludes the uh, the examples I have, um, and I'll open it up for questions. Any questions on any of this? Uh, okay. Um, you can do either. Um, there is a RAM disk on every single node, including the interactive logging nodes. So yes, there is a RAM disk there. You're going to be sharing it with all the other users that are interactively logged in who may or may not be using it. A some applications will automatically use it, and you'll see a whole bunch of files there from, from a variety of sources. Um, but um, there's typically a RAM disk, and there's a modicum of storage there that you actually really can use. Um, so in fact, yes, you can use it. Um, if you try to use a lot of it, like more than, say, four or eight um, gigabytes, so you, then you might start running up against the other applications that are ephemerally running on the system. And so you, you won't have the full um, storage available, necessarily. But for a few gigabytes, it's probably going to be fine. So you would have it available for that. If you need to guarantee that you have uh, much more storage than that, then a good approach is to just get a, um, an interactive session on a dedicated node. And it's easy to set up a job that does that, and that like I had done in the, um, earlier in this example. And, um, and then, you ha then you know you have 32 gigabytes to play with. And if you need more than that, then there we have up to one terabyte nodes on Wasabi and multi-terabyte nodes on Manji. So, um, so we have some really big memory systems that are available. The only drawback there is there's no guarantee with these interactive jobs that you'll get it immediately. Um, my experience, though, has been that um, most of the time, if I ask for an interactive job on one node, I'll get it within a few minutes. Good, good question. Any others? OK. Um, so we can end it here, or if there's interest, we can go through the, the hands-on exercise. What do people want to do? OK, I'll tell you what. I will review the hands-on exercise to give you the opportunity to ask, ask questions about it. But you're free to go through it at your own pace um, afterwards. And then we can also just open up for general questions. OK? Shall we do that?
So here's the hands-on, and this will be a quick review. So I'm not expecting you to go through each one of these steps, but I'll just talk about them, and then um, we can go through them in detail, um, and I can answer questions if you, have, if you run into any issue. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, OK, so the, um, this hands-on exercise will illustrate a typical project life cycle. Um, going from you're starting to get acquainted with the application, pulling it down perhaps from a repository, um, playing around with it to get used to it, um, try to, to do some experimental runs and looking at the data, and then um, doing some maybe some parameter space studies with it, organizing your data, sharing the data, and, and then staging it, storing it on tier two, for example, for later access and cleanup at the end. So that's what you might consider a typical life cycle for a project. Um, the example I have is very, very simple. Um, it's a simple little um, application um, that's written in C. And you can um, pull it down with wget from this URL. And I also have a copy of it staged on disk if, if there's any problems pulling that down. This will work on any of our Linux systems. Um, I'd recommend logging into maybe Masabi in order to have a fully functional system. Um, once you've pulled down the, um, the tarball, you can un, uh, untar it um, with this command here, and that will give you a little directory called cycles that you can go into. And if you type make in that directory, it will build the application. It's a tiny little C program. Um, then if you run cycles, the application itself, you'll get a synopsis um, how to use it, it basically it takes two arguments, two numbers basically. And so if you run it on two numbers, just give it two numbers, um, you'll get a thousand and one lines out, just two columns of numbers. And um, to make a long story short, what it gives you is it will draw the Siju figures. It just draws cycles of two different frequencies, one against the other. So you'll naturally get the Siju figures out of this. Um, if you plot them. And in fact, um, uh, I have um, an example called um, run it, which basically are these two lines that basically runs, run cycles on a pair of numbers, um, puts the output to a data file, and then I have a plot file that um, will plot it up. Um, and then you'll see the Lasiju figures plotted through X11 to your terminal. Um, there is another um, example script that basically will pass through the two arguments. You give it the two arguments to the script, it will redirect the output to a file and then plot that file up, whatever it is. And so you can play around with the um, program to get the various examples. And now we get to the meat of the, um, uh, this, where you start running parameter space studies and generating a lot of files. Um, so this is about for the data management and the workflow. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh -huh. OK, so um, here I run a parameter space study just in a shell script um, where I run it through a through parameter space of inputs, generating a whole bunch of files. And this is just to generate a bunch an example of a bunch of little files you might generate with a real application. And so this is in this, um, this shell script here. Um, so you, it's easy to just run that, and you'll get a whole bunch of files out that you can then start managing. Um, and so one of the things you can do is you can move them into an output directory. You can also tar them up um, into a, a tar file. And th these are a couple of standard ways of managing data. Um, and then you can copy it to your shared um, uh, directory to share it with the rest of your group. And then you can also, um, and if you do that, it's nice to do this recursive change mod, which changes the um, permissions to so that it's visible to everyone in your group. And that this is a this is a standard thing that lots of people will do. You can also post it to tier two storage for s archiving it or saving it for later use. Um, and for that, you can use an S3 CMD command to make a bucket and then push 
a file out there. So that just gives you an illustration of exercise in doing that. Now there's, if you want to save all the data with the um, files we've looked at so far, there's two ways of doing it. You can push individual files over, or you can do that uh, gzip tar file, all the same data, but all in one go. And the question is, which runs faster? Well, clearly what's going to run faster is when you put it across as one file, and that's for several reasons. First of all, what you'll see in running S3 CMD commands is you always get a one to two second latency for the application itself to start up and handshake with the tier two storage. Here you pay that latency once when you run one file, but here you're paying for it many dozens of times. So it's going to run much more slowly that way. Another factor is that one big file is a much more efficient way of using the tier two storage than a whole bunch of small files. The bandwidth is not, not only will you get better latency because you amortize that co latency cost to just once, but you also get much better bandwidth as well. You have a question? Okay. Um, so this just illustrates that it's a good idea to organize data into larger files if you're going to use tier two storage if you have a whole bunch of really small files. Um, then you can share the data in a variety of ways. There's, um, uh, there's a good, uh, we have URLs here for um, how you can share data on Ceph um, as a website. And then the final um, stage is cleanup, where uh, basically you, uh, you've, assuming that you've looked, uh, done the first pass at looking at the data, you've shared it, you've organized it with the rest of your, and shared it with the rest of your group, um, and you've, s you've saved the, the bulk of the data, and the, the parts you want to keep, to tier two storage, it's then time to clean up and actually think about removing the data off of disk, thereby freeing up room in your home directory and for your group for the next project. Um, and with that, uh, that ends the uh, formal presentation here, and I'll open it up for questions. Okay, so we can talk individually afterwards, and thank you for coming.